everyone's tired, so it's a good spot to be in. Depends which one I go. You want to stay down south or? attention. Uh, welcome to another one of our biomedical engineering department's uh, seminar talks brought to you by the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation. Today we have the honor and pleasure of hearing from Dr. Patrick Franzen um, regarding the important aspects of scholarly publishing as well as insights on many of the uh, things regarding publishing including um, metrics, uh, myths and misconceptions, um, current uh, company changes that are happening, as well as best practices for researchers. Dr. Franzen is the director of publication uh, at SPIE, the International Society of Photonics and Optics, and uh, what he is in charge of the business strategy and the innovation uh, regarding uh, proceedings and conference content, as well as journals, books, and multimedia. He's also an elected member of COPE, which is a Council on Publication Ethics. So, so without you know, further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Franzen. Awesome. So quick correction, I'm not a doctor. Uh, <laughs> Almost got a doctorate, but it was in U.S. history, not engineering or physics. But um, yeah, I have a lowly master's at the moment. Uh, but yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I am the director of publications for SPIE. Hopefully, everyone's familiar with us. Um, we put on Photonics West, if you've ever heard of that show, and have a number of journals in, uh, in biomedical engineering and biomedical optics space. Uh, this is less of a lecture, more of a discussion. I'm going to throw a ton of information at you. So please pepper me with questions as we go through. We got a bunch of slides. If you don't get to everything, oh well. Um, but I want to make sure that we're covering what's important uh, to this group. So, uh, quickly. Uh, so just quickly, my two co-authors uh, on this presentation. We actually they presented it at Fox West this year. Or Gwen Wirtz. Gwen oversees our journals program. She's our journals manager. Um, if you're a member of SPIE and you get our member magazine, Photonics Focus. She is also the editor in chief of that publication, and Nat is our director of or manager of technical content and scientific publishing. Matt's my scientist; he makes up for my lack of um, education and lack of knowledge in the space. Uh, he is not a PhD in optics from University of Arizona, and recently joined us after about 10, 15 years in the industry. So, just quickly, quick uh, outline and overview of what we're going to talk about today. First thing, we'll just go through basics on journal publishing. If there are things you know that we need to gloss over, please let me know. I don't want to spend time talking about things that are common knowledge, but we're going to talk about a lot of other random things as well. Um, it's a pretty complicated process. There's a lot going on. Um, and then in the second uh, part of the talk, we'll talk about some hot topics, mostly ethics, some myths, um, and what's going on with gen AI and large language models in publishing. Uh, the, Introduction of ChatGPT about what, 16 months ago, kind of threw a monkey wrench in all of our plans as publishers, and we've had to quickly adapt to accommodate and prevent fraud as a result of that. 
Uh, so quickly about SPIE, we're a big publisher. Uh, we've got nearly 610,000 publications. Uh, we're currently ranked 20th in the world in terms of size. Elsevier is one, Springer Nature is two. Um, so we're, we're number 20 for society publishers. We're number six. IEEE is by far the biggest, followed by the American Chemical Society. Uh, within our portfolio, we have 15 peer-reviewed journals, seven of which are gold and open access at the moment. Um, all three of our biomedical optics journals are gold OA. Uh, we put on a lot of conferences. <clears throat> Again, Photonics West being our biggest. Do about 25 SPIE conferences a year and capture all those talks in the forms of papers, presentation recordings, and posters. And we're also a big book publisher. So we publish about 25 to 30 new titles annually. The corpus um, includes more than 500 ebooks and 650 in print. And won't go through all the topics, but we're very broad. Uh, optics is incredibly is interdisciplinary. So we basically cover all the different topical areas within the space of optics. Everything from astronomy to biomedical, to lithography, uh, to sensors. So quickly, uh, quick snapshot, this is what our journals look like. See the covers. Um, and as I mentioned, we have 15 at the moment. Um, in this space, these are probably the three most important for you guys. JBO, which Jessica is on the editorial board on. Um, the irony is Jessica's actually in my neck of the woods at the moment. Um, SPI is based just south of Vancouver, and I think she's out there for a conference as we speak. But JBO is our flagship. It's actually the first journal that was ever published in biomedical optics. Brian Pogue from Wisconsin-Madison, who's the current editor-in-chief, has got a 3.5 impact factor. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's all gold OA. It's actually currently the number two ranked Biomedical Optics Journal in Web of Science. Uh, number one is it's one right to its right, Neurophotonics, which is a more focused journal. It's on uh, neurological applications within the optics space. Anna DeBoer from Boston University is the editor-in-chief. The impact factor for this journal right now is 5.3. And as part of Tonics West this year, we launched BIOS, which is our new journal. It's more on discovery and application rather than instrumentation. Um, Darren Rogler is the inaugural editor-in-chief, and it does not have an impact factor or a site score at the moment. Usually a journal has to be around for two to three years to get those distinctions. Uh, but what we're doing in the meantime is just waiving all the open access charges. So open access publishing in that journal is free at the moment. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. I have a question. Sure. Is there a committee in charge of all journals across? Yeah, so actually within the volunteer structure, um, so we have SPI staff, and then we have a SPI publications committee um, that I liaise with that oversees our overall strategy. Within uh, the SPI publications committee, there's a subcommittee called the Board of Editors, which is all the editor-in-chiefs from our 15 journals. There's about 20 members on that committee, and they set policies for journals. And then within each journal, we have an editorial board. So if you actually look at the size of the volunteer group that manages our journals, we have almost 600 associate editors across the portfolio. So we work with a lot of people in a lot of different ways, uh, which is exciting, right? We do get to interact with a lot of really intelligent, smart, brilliant people um, who are very creative and can push us in new directions. Uh, two other journals just want to call your attention to. Um, uh, Dr. Krasnock is actually on the, uh, is an AE for advanced photonics, but we've got two other gold OA journals. These are very broad. Um, if you haven't heard of advanced photonics or advanced photonics nexus, um, they're less, yeah, focused on a specific community and oversee or uh, cover optics in general. Um, advanced photonics right now has an impact factor of 17.3. Um, so that by far is our, our heaviest hitter when it comes to metrics at the moment. Uh, quickly, we'll just talk a little bit about your engagement with us. So FIU has published 318 papers uh, with SPIE. Those papers were downloaded more than 22,000 times last year. So big engagement. Um, last 14 months, we've had 13 different authors from campus uh, participate in our publications. We've had 10 different folks at our conferences. Um, you can see we've got a fellow, uh, which is Dr. Romello, senior member and 10 members. We've got a couple editorial board members. Um, and obviously we have an active student chapter. Um, so yeah, thanks for all the engagement. It's obviously important and we uh, you know, value your participation in the society. 
So quickly, uh, we'll just move into journal publishing if there are no other questions on, on that quick intro. So I, I do have a question sure. uh, differentiating between the society yep. and the, the publishing part. Okay. Right? So, I mean, it is two separate entities, but just under the name of one, right? Because you can be part of the society, right? But that has nothing to do with publishing. So publishing is a department within the society. So um, yeah, we are a, a society publisher. So um, when you, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a, uh, in a couple slides, but within SPIE, uh, we've got a number of different departments. We've got conferences, we've got membership that oversees our student chapters and all the engagement. Publishing is another department, and we're basically in charge of disseminating information and knowledge within the space. Um, so we work with you know, the optics and photonics community to make sure research get, is getting out there in a variety of formats. Um, so it's, there are other organizations that have, uh, I would say subsidiaries that are their publishing wing. That's not the case with SPIE. So like I said, if some of this is uh, kind of mundane or, or simple, tell me to skip. Um, but you know, one of the big things we talked about is how you pick the right, right journal. There are a lot of journals out there more journals get launched every day. So, um, you know, when, when you're looking to publish a paper, what should you focus on um, in terms of making the right decision for your research and for that paper? And the three things we'll focus on are scope, availability, and reputation. So when looking at scope, uh, the big, there are three big questions to ask. Uh, the one is, what are the stated aims and scope of the journal? And if your paper doesn't fit within those stated aims and scope, do not submit to that journal. Um, one of the big reasons we reject papers early on in peer review is they're out of scope. So taking the time to make sure that, you know, that journal is the right fit for your research is really important. It's gonna save you time, and it's gonna save all the reviewers and the, uh, the editors of the journal time. Um, again, the goal is to get your information, your research out as quickly as possible. Picking the wrong journal is gonna slow down that process potentially by months. Um, the other things to look at is who's actually publishing in the journal. Is it your peers? Is it people you know, people you socialize with at conferences or on webinars? Is it your professors? Um, you know, each area within SPIE, even, even within biomedical optics, there are communities. So is your community actually participating in that journal? Um, if it's a lot of folks you've never heard of, and they're publishing in topics that are not necessarily aligned with what you're doing, again, probably not a great fit. And uh, kind of following on that, is your paper similar to other papers that are being published? Um, if it's not, explore other avenues. There's plenty out there. Um, when you look at availability, there are a couple of things to take into account. Um, if there's a subscription journal, and it's hard to, to get this information, but do you think that it has a wide subscriber base? If it's niche and you know, it's only um, accessed by a handful of universities or organizations worldwide, your paper's not gonna reach a lot of eyeballs. Um, so you know, you're not doing yourself a ser uh, service in terms of download activity or citation activity. Is, are your journals available to all SPIE members? Uh, as a member, you can select journals, yeah, as part of your membership. There's, there's options. Um, in the case of our um, biomedical journals, they're all open access, which is the next thing. Um, if it's open access, everybody in the world has access to it. So there, there are fees that come with open access um, because there's no revenue tied to the subscription. Um, but you know, you'll have unlimited opportunities to reach the community uh, to get downloads, to get citations. Um, and when we talk open access, the other big thing to think about is cost. Um, publishing is not cheap. Um, it's probably the number one question I get is why is publishing so expensive? Anybody have any guesses why that is? The technology is expensive, um, but what you're actually, a lot of what you're paying for with an APC or a subscription isn't what's published. It's what's rejected and it's fraud. So every time a paper hits, uh, you know, any publisher's system, right? Any time a paper is submitted, there's cost. And in, with most publishers, 
you know, 75, 80% of papers are rejected, either because of quality or, you know, the, the quality of either the research, the language, scope issues. So there's an enormous amount of wasted cost in publishing at the moment, and you just can't eat that, right? So it actually gets offset in APCs and subscription pricing. When we get to fraud a little bit later, there's so much fraud going on, it's wildly expensive. Um, most publishers are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, I would say, in terms of fraud management to weed out what paper. Do you <laughs> but yeah, I mean, cost to publish is an important one. Um, if it's open access, the difference in an APC is the brand on your paper. That's basically what it comes down to. So if you want an SPIA paper, it's about seventeen hundred dollars. If you want a Nature paper, it's twelve thousand. Uh, and then last, reputation is a big one. So who's the publisher? You know, are they a respected publisher? Um, do a lot of prominent people publish uh, in that journal? Do they have clear policies? If you can't find the peer review process or editorial policies for a publisher or a journal, it's a red flag. Um, another thing to consider is the pace of peer review, right? Everybody wants a fast peer review process. Bottom line is, from submission to first decision, it's usually you know, 30 to 40 days. If you come across a journal that says it's three to five days, that's a huge red flag. That means they're not peer reviewing, it's impossible. Because it takes time to find reviewers, for them to read the material, reflect on it, you know, write a responsible review. Then it goes to the AE, and there's a, there's a whole cycle that happens there. So really fast peer review, huge red flag. Um, other big things are where is the journal indexed? So most of the discovery of research papers doesn't happen on a digital library platform like SPIEs or Opticas or IEEEs. It's through third parties, indices, like Web of Science and Scopus. Um, for the most part, publishers are gonna be transparent about where they send material for indexing. These are the two that you wanna keep an eye on. And then obviously, um, you know, citations matter and metrics that we'll talk about impact factor and site score in a little bit. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is there are two types of publishers, basically, in scholarly publishing. You have not-for-profits, that's us, which are society publishers and university presses. Um, we do generate revenue from publishing, but what we do is we invest it back in the community. So if you've ever had a student travel grant from us, scholarships, that comes through funds we generate from various activities with an SPIE. Um, generally, we're more affordable. We're not profit driven. I mean, we, we have to be sustainable, but we're not looking to, you know, raise, uh, you know, raise our, our, our stock prices or invest back to investors. Uh, you also have for profit publishers. So Elsevier, Springer Nature, Wiley, MBPI, Frontiers. They're basically either um, publicly owned, publicly funded entities that have stockholders that they have to, you know, obviously have a return on the investment or they're privately owned, and all the money basically just goes back for, for full profit activities. Um, a lot of literature on this, we'll get into it. Um, what's kind of crazy is um, open access, right? Everyone thinks of it as this great philanthropic activity that uh, you know creates more equity within scholarly publishing. It's actually hugely uh, lucrative for for profits. So I think it's the last three years, Springer Nature has made something like half a billion dollars on LA fees. Um, so those are the things I would also consider is, you know, if you're investing money in a publication, how is that money being used later on? Is it going to support the community or is it, you know, going to somebody's next Maserati? Impact factor. Everyone cares about impact factor, right? Um, it's important. It's a good metric. Impact factor and site score, which probably folks are not too familiar with site score, do is they measure citations at a given point in time. So impact factor, we'll have impact factors coming out June 30th this year. And what it actually looks at are the number of citations that happened in 2023 for papers published in 2021 and 2022. Anything that does not fall within that range does not contribute to impact factor. So when you see an impact factor go up, it means there were some really good papers within that window. If it goes down, those papers cycle down. So it's, it's kind of this volatile metric. Um, and what it does is it actually measures the quality of a journal based on a few select individual contributions. 
psych score, which are folks familiar with psych score? No, it's an alternative. It looks at a bigger snapshot. So instead of looking at uh, two years of papers, it looks at four. So you'll see site scores almost always are higher than impact factors because it's looking at a bigger sample size. But the same thing is it's, it's a metric that evaluates the quality of the journal based on the citations that papers within that journal are getting over a period of time. Uh, so two good important metrics. Um, they're not all end all be alls. So it's, it's important to look at other things too, like download activity, um, social media posts. Um, one of the things we look at a lot is patent activity. So we're an applied society, right? We have a lot of engineers. And we have some papers that are cited thousands of times by academic journals. We have other papers that are almost never cited, but they're in hundreds of patents. So we've got ones that contribute to knowledge and ones that turn into a product that you have at home. Uh, publish the process of publishing. This is kind of what it looks like. And the uh, circles in yellow are where you will be involved as authors. So it's submission, revision, and production. And we'll go through these really quickly. One second. So uh, before you submit, take things to do. Read the author guidelines. Uh, doesn't do you any favors if you gloss over the guidelines. Submit a paper and you, you know, missed everything. Just have to, it would be immediately rejected. You'd have to go right back through and resubmit. Uh, make sure that all the authors are included. It's a big one. Um, names, affiliations, and email addresses. There, are, um, when we get to the fraud thing, there's a lot of authorship for sale and a lot of strange things happen with author lists. So as a publisher, it helps us verify that everyone included in that author list is legitimate and deserves to be on the paper. Um, make a decision on open access and what the license type is. Um, we won't get into it today, but there are many different flavors of open access and many different licenses. Most common, we talk about gold open access is CCDY 4.0, which basically allows anyone to do anything with the paper so long as they provide citation. Um, but there are other forms, non-commercial, non-derivative, that mean people can't you know, take your paper and transform it into a different publication. Without, without your knowledge. And then funding, especially in this space, is really important, right? NIH has all sorts of mandates. There's all sorts of um, new policies being put in place by the US government. So it's really important um, in this day and age to make sure you're capturing your funder's name, their grant numbers, and making sure that you're clear on what are your responsibilities regarding data, code, and publication. Uh, open data, big thing. I'm sure you're talking about it on campus. Um, making sure you have a data availability statement in your paper and then pointing to where that data lives is becoming, I would say, almost required within the biomedical optics space. Um, other things to consider about read and publish, which uh, is basically if your library subscribes to a, a journal, um, you can also add in open access fees, um, something to worth considering and talk to your subject librarian about. Um, this mostly applies to um, low-income countries, but if there are discounts available, um, in the case of uh, FIU, um, you know, I think you do get discounts on the APCs um, as a result of your activity with us. Um, if there are people who contributed to the paper who aren't authors, make sure they're acknowledged. Um, when we get to the ethics piece, we'll talk a little bit about author disputes, which are quite common. Um, so making sure that you clearly identified who is an author in a paper is critical, but also who contributed to that paper, who did not um, have as much involvement to earn, earn the title of author or the distinction of author. And um, this is pretty common with most journals, but um, if you look at uh, the journal you're submitting and you want to request a specific associate editor, or you want to avoid a specific associate editor, mostly it's because of conflict of interest, um, please disclose that. Just, it helps with the process. Peer review. Um, so there are three types of peer review, single, double, and open. Um, single anonymous is probably the most common. That's where the peer reviewer knows who the authors are, but the authors don't know who the peer reviewer is. Double, everybody's anonymous. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of energy behind double anonymous peer review recently. The only thing is in many of these communities, they're so small 
that even if the author names are you know stricken from the record, they you know the person reviewing still has an idea who it is. Um, so it's probably not as effective at eliminating bias and some of the prejudices um, as that it hopes to do. And then open peer review is everybody knows everything about everyone, um, and you've got all sorts of different models. Uh, eLife publishes all the reviews, so the reviews actually travel with the paper, so you can actually see the, the dialogue tied to a specific research paper when it's published. It can be good and bad. There are some reviews that we get from peer reviewers that are very professional, and some are downright nasty. Um, so you actually have to, you know, kind of uh, take that with a grain of salt and, and tread carefully when it comes to peer review. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Does SPA has all these three uh, reviews? We, we are single. Oh. Yeah. And it's at the moment. Um, that could change. And we were talking about some of our the volunteer leadership. We actually had a whole discussion with the board of editors, so all of our editor in chiefs about that, um, whether we needed to make it a change. And the consensus was that the process we have in place is working uh, effectively. Um, and then just quickly, in terms of responding. Um, so take all the feedback you get from reviewers into consideration. You don't have to do everything they say, um, but acknowledge it. Um, word of advice is read what the editor says before the peer reviewers. So what happens in the peer review process? More often than not, it's two or three peer reviewers review the paper, provide their feedback. That then goes to the associate editor who's on the editorial board, who reads through the reviews and will kind of come up with a synthesized report on steps forward. Um, so start with the AE, then go to the reviews. Uh, just, just a good practice. Um, write a response um, that talks about the fact that, first of all, you read what they had to say and took into consideration their feedback. And then highlight what changes you made as a result of that. Again, you don't have to do it all. Um, but for the most part, they're going to have constructive feedback. And the big thing is submit it by the deadline. Um, when we talk about how slow publishing can be, it's these steps that drag it out. Um, there's a lot of papers in the system at any given any given point, and you don't want to do yourselves a dis disservice by falling lower in the in the line. Okay, and then you're accepted, which is good news. Um, so what happens next? So the paper actually goes to copy editor. So um, despite the fact that you might think you have the perfect manuscript, we're going to edit it. Um, there's some style changes we're going to make. We're going to look at things like references, make sure they're formatted correctly. Um, you know, make sure that you know it reads appropriately, and these are all done you know by professional folks. So um, it's it's constructive feedback. Don't have to necessarily agree with every edit that's made, um, but we are trying to improve the paper and make it as readable and legible as possible. You get proofs, which is basically a, a copy of what your paper is going to look like when it's published. Um, again, reviewed proof. Quick turnarounds are always appreciated. Um, your paper will be published. Papers published one at a time, for the most part, almost with every publisher. Um, but we need uh, volumes to close before we can start indexing. So you might publish a paper and realize that it's not in the Web of Science or Scopus for a month or so. It's because it's waiting for that, that issue to close. Um, and at that point, all the papers in an issue get fired off to the indexers. Uh, and the big thing that people don't do, probably as much as they should, is promote their own work. The best advertising for your paper is yourself and your peers. Um, you know, SPIE, Optica, publishers send out marketing material, but it goes to a huge audience and a lot of people who aren't necessarily interested in the topic you're publishing on. So doing your own social media uh, promotion, sharing the article via email with colleagues is really probably the best way to get um, make an impact in terms of where, where your research is. Any questions on all of that? Can sure. students be peer reviewers? I know I get like some emails sometimes like, oh, you know, Dr. Carson, but I'm not a doctor yet. <laughs> you should review this paper, blah, blah, blah. Is that uh, a yep. thing? So for the uh, yes and no, um, are they journals you recognize? Some of them, yes. OK. Some of them. So uh, generally, if, for peer review, if it's a journal you recognize, the invitation is coming from an associate editor. So um, if that associate editor 
feels that you have the technical chops and the experience to provide you know, a cogent review, then that is legitimate. Um, if you're getting it from journals you've never heard of, they're probably up to something. Um, but you know, we, we work with a lot of people who don't have PhDs. Right? There's a, tons of engineers in, in optics who have masters, or even bachelors, but they've got a, you know, they've been in the industry for a while. They've got this depth of knowledge through experience that gives them the, the technical ability to provide a good peer review. So I would say there's no hard and fast rule. Um, for the most part, I would say, as an undergrad, if you're an undergraduate, you probably will not be invited as a peer reviewer, but a lot of peer reviewers come out of, of you know, grad students, postdocs, that, that level, so. All right, let's go into ethics. So I'll just pause on this. This is what's going on right now in the industry. And the one I don't have up there is, uh, there's an Elsevier journal that the introduction was actually a prompt, it just came out. So what that points to is really, really reviewed it. Does everybody know about the infamous rat from Frontiers? Okay. We'll send a link out afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, lots of stuff going on. Um, lots of stuff going on. So quickly, so COPE. COPE is an um, organization I'm involved in as a volunteer. I sit on the board. They're a COPE council. COPE is the governing body of ethics in publishing. Um, obviously, pretty international. It includes publishers, uh, also a lot of researchers, editors-in-chief. And what we do is we provide guidance and advice on best practices. So go back to the idea of ChatGPT. Nobody knew what to do with ChatGPT when it came out. You know, could it be an author? Could it be a reviewer? How do you use it? Uh, Code Council is the group that came together and provided guidance. So if you look at any publisher's policies on the use of uh, Gen AI right now, most of that ties back to code. Um, so what, what they do and what we do is we uh, provide you know, resources, we educate, we support publishers, institutions, um, universities in publishing ethics. Um, SPIE is a COPE member. There's actually a university membership program that FIU could possibly join in the, in the future. Um, and basically what it does is things come up that you don't know what to do with. This is an independent arbitrary board that, you know, can remove themselves from a specific situation uh, because, you know, as a publisher or a researcher, when issues come up, you kind of take it personally from time to time. So to get that impartial feedback and that impartial, um, you know, uh, yeah, impartial feedback is probably the best way to put it, is, is what most people turn to go for. So within ethics, these ones will be no surprise. Um, these are kind of the basic ones. Plagiarism still happens, despite the fact that there is really robust software out there that catches plagiarism. So please do not plagiarize. Your paper will be rejected, even before it gets to an editor. Um, and if it's particularly egregious, you will be sanctioned. So you'll be barred from publishing with that publisher for up to a few years. Um, so it's never gonna get past. Make sure you're citing people appropriately. Make sure you're not copying and pasting. Um, data fabrication is another big issue. Uh, if you've been following some of the ethics things happening up in Boston, uh, I think it was Brigham and Women's, there's I think 34 papers that have been retracted because they manipulated the data. Um, again, something you also do not want to do. Um, data fabrication doesn't happen by accident, right? It's, it's purposeful. Um, and you know, it's one of those things that actually could be career suicide depending on how egregious it is. Um, duplicate submissions is something else you have to watch out for. I, we know the submission process is very slow at every publisher, and it can be frustrating. But you can only submit a paper to one journal at a time. Um, you can withdraw a paper, so make sure that if you're you know, fed up with you know, the process at publisher ABC, you withdraw that paper before you submit it to the next publisher. Um, and then author disputes, like we talked about a little bit with the author list, it's a big thing that's coming up all the time. Um, so just make sure that everyone who's contributed the paper is clear on whether they'll be listed as an author or as a contributor uh, when that publication comes out. Uh, I had a question with the data availability statements yep. that are happening and also like um, reaching out to the contributing authors. Sometimes mm -hmm. 
they change institutions? Yep. Like their email might change. So how how does the journal like keep up with that, or do they often reach out? Um, yeah, that's tricky. Um, so I can't speak to every journal. For the most part, we have two email addresses for just about everybody who interacts with SPIE. Um, one, for the most part, is institutional. One, um, assuming people uh, provide it to us is personal. So you know, we'll have an FIU and a Gmail because we do realize that right, people bounce around. Um, and typically, the, the hope would be that the lead author is still connected enough to these folks that they're able to reach out. Um, you know, LinkedIn's a good tool for that too, and, and some of the other, some of the other avenues. All right, so now, now we'll get into the good stuff. So paper mills, anyone know what a paper mill is? Okay, so uh, if you don't publish them with a paper mill. So paper mills sell papers. We'll talk about that a little bit more on, on the next slide. Uh, and what's interesting is we, uh, a colleague of mine is going to a webinar next week where one of the talks is an anonymous talk. So I'm curious to see how they do it. I feel like it's gonna be, you know, like a, one of those crime shows things where they, you know, dub the voice and, you know, uh, put, put the person in the shadows. But they're gonna actually talk about why they purposely chose to publish through a paper mill. Because uh, the logic doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if you didn't actually do the research, what's the point? Uh, but it's happening more and more. Um, authorship for sale is another big thing that's happening. Uh, where, again, we go back to the author list, someone will approach you and say, you know, here's $1,000, put me as author four on your paper. Uh, again, it, these are things we catch. So uh, not good practices and could lead to career suicide. And then predatory journals uh, is another thing that you're gonna encounter a lot. So, you know, at some point in your careers, could be happening right now, you will start getting peppered with requests from journals to publish or peer review and you've never heard of those journals. There are thousands of predatory journals out there which are basically fake. Um, they almost all are open access and what they do is they accept papers, you give them a, a, you know, a couple hundred bucks, they're usually pretty cheap and they might not even publish the paper. Um, they're basically just, uh, I don't know, it's a racket uh, to, to generate finances. Um, so when you're looking at journals to submit to or journals to review for, do some due diligence. Um, if you've never heard of the journal, go to their website, see who's involved, um, ask your advisor. Uh, you know, it's becoming more and more of a problem. So being uh, approaching new, new journals with trepidation is probably a best practice. Um, you don't wanna get burned by these groups. So yeah, so talking a bit, a bit more about publication fraud. Um, so paper mills, as I mentioned, are uh, profit-oriented legal organizations that produce and sell fake manuscripts. Um, there's enormous uh, pressure to publish in certain types of the worlds. This is why these are catching on. Um, for example, in China, if you want to graduate um, as a grad student, you have to publish. So you know, there, there's enormous pressure to get out publications. Um, and you know, it, paper mills are a problem across the world. We encounter, you know, universities and, and folks in the U.S. who are participating as well. So it, it's an international issue. Peer review rings are another huge problem at the moment, and it's basically organized networks of authors, editors, and reviewers who work together to expedite manuscripts and make sure they get published. Um, so it's, I'll help you out, you and you help me out in return. And similarly, citation rings, where you have people just citing one another to boost their H indexes. Um, even when those citations aren't appropriate. Um, and if you actually look at the, the graphic on the left there, um, one of the things we do behind the scenes is we track papers for sale. So these are Facebook groups that you can join. I would not recommend joining them and buy papers in reputable publications. Um, so for example, if you want to publish in scientific reports, you can buy a paper probably right now and get them scientific reports. Um, and as you can see, these are big, right? You got 124,000 members of the, the top group, 139,000 a second. So it's not like it's a, you know, a handful of individuals that are participating. These are massive organizations. So when we talk back about why is publishing expensive, publishers have to safeguard against this. And we're dealing with an onslaught of submissions, 
and other issues that are extremely expensive to deal with. Um, they also come at a huge opportunity cost. So there's a lot of things we could be doing to improve the technology, the infrastructure, you know, different tools, streamline, make publishing more efficient. The problem is we're wasting resources on this kind of nonsense. So transition quickly, uh, truths or myths. If you publish a proceedings paper, can you publish that work in a journal? Right. So say you submitted a paper to Phonics West. Can you publish that same paper or a similar paper in biomedical optics, engineering, or express, excuse me? The proceedings paper, like uh, an abstract? Uh, conference paper. It's one of the big myths. People won't submit a paper to a proceeding because then they, they feel they can't publish it in a journal. It's all a fallacy. Um, what happens is a proceeding is, you know, generally just reviewed by the chairs. It doesn't go through the rig rigorous peer review process. And peer review changes a lot of things, right? So inherently, a proceedings paper becomes a different publication by the time it publishes in a journal. So. Um, you get to come to BIOS at the Phonics West next year, and you're presenting whatever you present. If you publish that paper, you can then, you know, refine, expand on that paper, and publish it in JDO or BOE or uh, any other journal um, later on. So, but that is one of the big, the big myths that that we hear all the time. Um, preprints. People familiar with preprints? Okay. And uh, preprints and proceedings. I'll just jump ahead. Are not roughly the same. So preprints uh, would be what you post to bioarchive, meta-archive, or archive. It's basically, it's a kind of a rough manuscript of what will then mature into a journal paper. Um, a lot happens with preprints too, that you know, as you go through the process of publishing, and peer review, and you know, of working with AEs, a lot of the, uh, the data and the content will be refined further, so they, they actually uh, evolve quite substantially. Uh, but preprint, again, is basically, it's an early, draft of what you expect to turn into a journal paper later on in life. A proceedings paper is a capture of what was presented at a conference, basically. So when you get up on stage or you're presenting a poster, um, if you want to share that information more broadly, which you know we always encourage people to do, because at a conference you're only reaching you know, a handful of people. Um, the paper, again, will reach thousands. Uh, but basically what you're doing in that is capturing what you talked about at that specific so they are, they are different things. All right. Um, the last thing what we're going to talk about a little bit is AI and LLMs. This, this is a big thing. So every publisher that I know of right now has pretty hard policies and strong policies on the use of chat, GPT, and similar software in the publishing process. LLMs are incredibly helpful. Um, they're great tools. They do a lot of really interesting things and they, they're very helpful, especially you know, if you struggle with English, um, struggle with you know, writing, things like that. They can, you know, it's like a, uh, I don't know, spell check and grammar check on steroids, right? Um, so you know, what we encourage folks to do is use LLMs to find gaps in, your, in the research, to survey existing literature. Um, you know, one of the downsides with LLMs at the moment is we're getting inundated with AI-generated review papers because what they're really good at doing is generating review papers, which basically synthesize a lot of original research. Um, so that's one of the downsides. Um, you know, they're great for gathering background information on the topic, again, cleaning up language and grammar. Um, and they're really, really good at cleaning up a reference list. Um, you have to be careful. There have been instances where uh, LLM, chat GPT, generate fake references, and include them in papers. Um, but in terms of some of that, you know, mundane, tedious stuff that happens when you write a paper, they're great. The only thing that we request, and most uh, publishers request, is when you submit the paper, disclose that you use them and how you use them. Because there's software that uh, picks up on LLM use. You don't want to have that flag against you, right? That almost guaranteed rejection um, if you're not disclosing it and you, you know, the, the publisher picks up on the fact you used a, an LLM or ChatGPT. Um, don't use it to write anything. They cannot be authors. 
Um, again, the, the Elsevier paper that published a few days ago is infamous because the prompt is the introduction. Uh, it literally says, you know, this would be a good way to start the introduction. So it's, I mean, that's just sloppy writing. Um, you know, don't use it to create figures or charts based on your data, uh, especially if you don't necessarily want all that getting out there, right? If you use a public facing uh, LLM like ChatGPT, anything you put in there, it learns from and it becomes public. So if you've got IP, be protected, you know, proceed with caution. Um, you don't want to use it to assemble your references, as I mentioned, but for formatting, it's great. And don't use it to write your cover letter. Um, there are instances where they basically come up with a template and we know what an AI generated uh, cover letter looks like. If you're using, uh, if you're peer reviewing a paper, also make sure that you review um, guidelines for peer review. Um, there are very prescriptive rules on what you can use LLMs for for peer review. Um, again, big no-no, don't use it to write your, your review. We, we see that too, that the prompts will be left in. Yep. What about figures that don't have to do with your data, like descriptive figures of like a process or something that you could do in like PowerPoint? Like, um, you know? I think, so in our, with SPIE, I would not use it. Um, like I said, we, we have tools that flag that type of stuff, um, and we spit out reports. So it's, uh, you know, you don't necessarily want content created from an, uh, a Gen AI tool. Uh, other publishers might have different policies, but in our case, I would not do that. Um, particularly, I assume most people are using ChatGPT for some stuff, right? Yeah. For example, in especially in biomedical engineering departments, mm -hmm. we, a lot of us might be using BioRender for figure generation. Okay. What, what is the rule for such platforms? Uh, so I'm actually unfamiliar with BioRender. Um, so okay, it's, a, it's a platform where you have a lot of templates, biology related, mm -hmm. which you use for generating your figures. So okay. it's, it's like a, a different platform. Uh, can be subscription based, I guess. Okay, I, that, that's probably fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what we find with ChatGPT is a lack of control in some cases. Um, so if we go back to, scroll back quick. This guy who got published um, was ChatGPT, he's AI generated. And basically uh, it's completely false, it's, it's impossible. It's an absurdity, which is why it's everyone's favorite example. Because it made it all the way through, right? It's actually, in, it's been retracted since, but it made it into the published literature. And what they did is they used an AI tool, Gen AI tool, to create a figure that is basically just this preposterous thing. Um, so that, that's the only problem there is, you know, it occasionally does crazy stuff. Um, and it's not something that if I were an author, I'd want to risk you know, my academic reputation on, uh, right? That's a big black eye is when um, you do something and it's, it's so absurd that, you know, I mean, I think that's, that story made it to CNN. It, it got picked up so widely. All right. So that's basically what I have. What haven't we covered? What other questions um, do you have about publishing, SPIE, anything in general? Hopefully, learn something new. Yeah. Yeah. About citation links, like how do you find out? Uh, um, so, what they do is you look for abnormalities. Um, I'll just scroll back, I should just stay on that slide. So, uh, one of the things that we check is when you look at reference lists, um, papers that have been referenced that have no application to what that paper is talking about at all. Um, you know, they're not necessarily 180 degrees removed, but maybe, you know, 20, 30% removed, where you're like, hmm, it could be relevant to this paper, but it doesn't really make sense. Um, and one of the other things too, is if you talk about like Clarivate or Web of Science, they track all this stuff. So Web of Science, um, every year comes out with a list of the most influential researchers in the world. And they base it basically on citations, right? It's, it's ancient disease. 
Uh, this past year, they uh, identified 8,000 highly cited researchers for their list. They eliminated 1,000 of them because of citation manipulation. So again, it's one of those things that people think they can get away with it. They might for a couple papers, eventually we catch on. Whether it's us, other publishers, um, you know, scholarly indices, and uh, basically what you do is you, you, you find abnormalities. Um, and you'll find abnormalities in strange places. So there's uh, some news yesterday, I think it's, I forget if it's, I think it's University of Zurich just bowed out of the, um, but Times Higher Education University rankings. You know, I know when I was driving through campus, right, you guys remember four, um, for, uh, like public colleges or something. So what happens there is you actually have universities that are also gaining the system to increase rankings. So um, if you look at the optics category, and I haven't looked at it recently, but two of the top 10 schools in optics in the world, I have never heard of. They've never published with SPIE or optics. So they're doing something. Uh, they're gaming the system. And a lot of that is through false manipulation of citations. Can I follow a question? So mm -hmm. is this the duty of the peer reviewer or it's the publisher? It's a combination. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, and I mean, the, the big thing with a lot of this is you need a big sample size to find the problem, right? It's, if you're doing it, you know, one or two times, it's not gonna make a huge change. When your H index goes from an 18 to a 70 in one year, it's kind of a, a big red flag. Um, so there, it's probably more widespread than we know. What we're becoming effective at is, you know, weeding out the really, really egregious cases. Um, but like anything else, at some point it's, it's going to catch up to you. So uh, my recommendation is cite the appropriate literature in your papers. Right? Um, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, it'd be really great if you could cite my paper. It's kind of related. Um, if, it's, if it's, you know, not relevant or it's not something you would normally cite, deny the request. Um, and like I said, I think it's becoming more and more critical. Uh, obviously, we, well, we, we did this talk at uh, Phonics West, Gwen did, and we had a question from someone in the audience. And one of her requirements to graduate is she needed to publish in a um, journal that had at least a seven impact. Right? In the engineering space, those are few and far between, right? Um, and, you know, how do you do that? And how do you get to that level? You need to, you know, have a reputation that, you know, allows you to publish in, in a high impact, high impact journal, right? Um, your first paper is not going to be a nature paper. I hate to break it to you guys. Um, and, you know, a way to get there is, you know, gaming the system a little bit. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Um, for new journals, uh -huh. um, how are they established? Or do you find the need first, or can you like follow up existing young journals? Or yeah. I guess also and those live journals, like when do you decide like this is? Yeah, so it's tricky. So um, it depends. There's there's different methodologies. Um, some of it is for uh, business reasons, where you know. You have to stay relevant. You have to, you know, maintain market share. So you might launch, you know, a broad-based journal. Um, you know, in our case, the Advanced Photonics One, Scientific Reports, PLOS One, that cover a huge scope, uh, basically to make sure that you're meeting the needs of everybody in the community. We do a lot of, I would say, community-based journals. So we've got the biomedical journals, which tie to the bio symposia. We've got a journal, Journal of Medical Imaging, that ties back to my medical imaging symposia. Um, JADIS is our astronomy journal that goes to our astronomy conference. So typically what we do is we look at different communities within SPIE, um, see if we're addressing the peer review needs for that community effectively, and if we're not, we'll look for potentially a new journal. Um, you know, one of the areas we're talking about right now a lot is quantum, right? Quantum fits within all of our journals, but we don't have a clear quantum journal. Um, typically what we do there is then we um, explore the idea with volunteers and make sure that there's enough energy um, and endorsement from our PubsCom and that community. If there is an energy or endorsement, it's gonna fail. So we won't go down that road. Um, in terms of sunsetting journals, we look at that occasionally. 
Um, you know, there's one journal that you know we have our eye on within the portfolio at the moment, and it might be you know uh, not necessarily sunsetting it, but reinventing it. Right? As the technology moved away from where um, you know the intent when it was launched, and should we pivot it to make sure that it's staying relevant and um, keeping up with the times and advances in optics. But yeah, and there's a, there's just a lot going on right now in terms of. Uh, Launches from everybody. I mean, Nature launches a few journals every year, so do I always bring in things like that. Do you have any insights or advice for an author who are new to this space or have any success? Um, I think the best piece of advice, well, there's a couple. Talk to your advisor. Um, you know, the faculty that you're working with have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to publishing papers, right? They've all published. They've reviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of papers. So they've seen it all. Um, the, the other big one is just be realistic and um, make a prudent choice in terms of what journal you should um, you know, submit to. So you know, again, look at, your, look at your content, look at your peers. Um, you know, if, you're gonna, if your first paper I would not submit to nature, it's going to get rejected, unless it's this absolute groundbreaking research. Um, so I think you know, just be realistic about you know what's the best outlet for your for your paper, and seek the advice of advisors, your librarians. Um, you know these people have a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge in the area, and they can probably guide you in, in the correct direction. Thank you. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Do you, do you recommend sending like um, I know sometimes you can send the editor an email, like not with the whole paper, but just like an overview of what it what it is. Um, you could. Uh, I would probably, again, I'd go talk to an advisor or other faculty members. Um, you know, there are so many papers that hit editors that, you know, it's one of those that um, if you know the person, they might take the time to read it. But I would say oftentimes it's probably going to just fall on deaf ears. Um, and it, it depends on the size of the journal, too. Like if it's a smaller journal, so like our neurophotonics journal, you know, we only publish about 100 papers, 120 papers a year. Uh, probably gets uh, 500 submissions, which is still a lot, right? It's, it's over a paper a day. Um, but, you know, the likelihood that, you know, might be read with a journal of that size is higher than scientific reports that publishes 33,000 papers a year, right? And they're just, you know, they probably get 100,000 submissions, so. Other questions, comments? So uh, just quickly, uh, before we wrap up, here's my contact info. Feel free to email me uh, questions after this or any other concerns. Uh, three good resources to keep an eye on. Um, COPE, most of the resources on COPE's website are free. So if you have questions about anything, chances are there's case study or an example or guidelines. Um, as authors, it probably won't come up that much, but if you're doing peer review and you have a question on the process or things like that, Tons of resources out there. Um, it's good to make yourself familiar with them. Um, other Two other things we keep an eye on are Retraction Watch, which tracks all the fraud that's going on. Um, it also tracks retractions. They have a retraction, basically it's a log. Uh, and that's a big thing too, when you write a paper, make sure you're not citing something that was retracted. Um, it's really hard sometimes to find that stuff. So for example, um, if you're using ResearchGate, or other sources, rather than the actual publisher, um, to, to find papers, a retraction notice might not necessarily make it to that third party site. Um, so as a good practice, I would always just go back to the publisher's own website, verify that it's a legitimate paper. You know, 999 times out of 1,000 it's going to be. Um, but yeah, you don't definitely don't want to make, sh make sure you don't uh, cite retracted com content. And then PubPeer is kind of a newer platform um, that's kind of like crowdsourcing of potential ethics issues. Uh, people will raise concerns and it allows for public discourse. Uh, it's one of those things that, that we now keep an eye on too, is when we have a, you know, a paper that comes in that seems suspicious or an author that you know, you know, we're unsure of, we'll check these resources just to see if they have a, a history of bad behavior or if there's been you know, concerns or allegations raised against them. So um, 
you know, by no means, you know, are these all black and white, but I, I find them to be good resources when I work through uh, SPIs on portfolio. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.